Okay. All right. Good evening. Good I'd evening. like to welcome everyone to the Thursday, October 5th, 2023 planning board meeting. If we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, introduction to board members. Uh, we have Don Ganarelli on the far left, and then Jerry Graybill, myself, Michael LaRue, Les Bodwell, and Rick Raines. We also have Irish Griffith, the code enforcement officer, Terry Wilson, the assistant to coding and planning, and Hannah Watson from SMPDC. Um, next is gonna be the first public hearing for conditional use Beaver Dam Campground, 551 School Street, R53, Lot 13A, Zone R3, Walsh Engineering. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Bill Walsh with Walsh Engineering. Um, I think we're, and I'm going to turn to Terry a little bit here. We have submitted a package, and I don't know if you've seen that um, last week, but I think it's going to be carried on to next week or next meeting, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we've got, um, we're kind of in the same place, but we have um, heard those four or five comments that the board had last time, the pickleball noise, uh, parking, um, snow storage, ENS, and an environmental review, and all of those are in that package, so you will be getting all of that information. So um, I'm happy to go through it if you want, but if you want, if you want to wait until next time, I'll leave that up to you. Wait until next wait. time. Yep. Just okay. finish the open public comment. Okay. It's a public hearing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So we'll just see if anyone has to speak uh, and make their comments. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Laura Sheldon, and I just have a question regarding Beaver Dam Campground. One of the questions that was being addressed last time was whether or not um, there was enough parking, whether or not the parking was going to be for an actual restaurant or just for the campsites. And so, obviously, I think that that needs to be addressed as far as bringing forth any public concerns there may be about the parking in that place. Again, if it is a restaurant that is open, in the current plans that we have seen, again, obviously it sounds like something's changing, um, but in that current plan, um, there are only enough parking sites for the campground sites. They're then saying that surplus parking was going to happen on the septic tanks, which apparently that road was only supposed to be for um, golf carts coming and going, but now if they're gonna have parking, is that happening? And if they are having a restaurant, how many people are coming in and out of that driveway regularly and i know from my own experience when i was in college i waitressed and we would seat that restaurant six to eight times in a day so if they're having a seating of 50 how many how many servings you know is is that going to be is it going to be a takeout restaurant where people aren't even needing to stay for an hour you know is that going to be continuous traffic coming in and going out how, how much traffic is that going to create for that very tightly congested little space that is already so dangerous, has already had so many accidents in the last few years. So I think that issue of the restaurant and um, whether or not there's actually going to be um, a need for greater parking that is already there really needs to be addressed for that public concern to come forward. Okay, thank, thank you. you. John Van Dusen, 557 School Street. Uh, I just have a question. This I brought this up last time about my concern about this ultimately becoming some sort of mobile home park or something. I'm still very concerned about the fact that we are creating, they are creating 
essentially a little village of mini houses. Uh, I haven't heard any talk about how long the rentals are going to be. Does this have any impact on the school system? Are there going to be children there? Are there going to be families that potentially could be living there for a year or two years or however long they want to lease these things? I would really like to hear from somebody as to what the plan is. I mean, like I say, we're creating a little village and I just kind of want to know what it is. Um, there's something about this that just doesn't ring true and I really want to somehow peel this onion back and find out what the master plan is here because it just doesn't make a ton of sense to me but maybe someday I'll figure it out. Thank you. My name is Dave Cathias. I have bought this property I say about eight years ago I was required to do an environmental impact study on my property that abuts this. In that, they found landing turtles, which shut me down. It's ex understood. I don't have an issue with that. When I read this, the, the vernal pool that they said didn't contain anything, well, I was 20 feet away from that, pulling blanding turtles out of traps with the biologist marking them, take blood samples, you know, I, I understood that. Today I talked to the biologist at the fi wildlife fisheries, and the biologist for turtles said he hasn't been here to do a study. He said, but he thinks he knows who did. They brought a dog, but that dog doesn't do blending turtles. It does other type of turtles. So I think this impact study was insufficient, and in so, if that study is insufficient, the 250 foot buffer has to be regulated. And they're working with this in, within this 250 foot buffer. The, uh, I, I looked at the, the drawings, within that buffer there's over 2,000 linear foot of excavation that has to happen for electrical, water, and sewer. The sewer that's there is adequate for what was there for a 10 to 10 month, 10 week to three month period. The sewer that's designed, and it just was brought up, is it good for more than three months, six months? Is it good for one person, for every person in that restaurant? We, we don't even know how big that thing, well, I know how many linear uh, square foot it is, but I don't know how many seats it's gonna have. So that, that all that has to be figured out in order to design an adequate septic system. How much impact is it going to do on the water with the restaurant and all these sites? And uh, I already, Janet Mills pushed something out two years ago about these homes. And she said uh, if they stay in place, well the, the law passed, if they stay in place more than 180 days, Code enforcement has to, officer has to do an inspection. If they're hard piped, hard wired, uh, has to monitor the septic to see that it's hooked up properly, then it's taxable property. It's not an, a tech, uh, like registering a car. It's taxable property. These are some of the issues that I saw. We, I know there's a main erosion and sediment control issue there. I don't know if it took in, into consideration all of this linear footage that they're doing. The septics that were over on the northerly side were just dumped into the old septic system through a, a cart. <laughs> now they've got a trench all the way over. And I turned mine off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And, uh, they, but they now they're going to be piped all the way across the whole thing. That's where I get the, the linear footage out of. Uh, there's also the pools. There's also the bathhouse. There's a, there's a lot to consider in this about erosion control and the fact that there is a 250 foot buffer. I told the guy from the DEP and I told the guy from fisheries that we were having a meeting tonight, but nobody could come. And a one-day notice. 
but they are very interested, especially the fact that they didn't even know this was happening. So that's that's one of the issues there. So I I want to know when they put these model homes in, if every one of these is on a float a concrete pad, concrete pad for each one, <coughs> installed greater than 180 days. The Code Enforcement Officer inspects for stable ground and inspects for utility connections. Uh, I talked about the taxation after 180 days. And uh, I can give anybody the the main house bill, LD 1530, May 5th, 2021, that said all this. And uh, these model homes, are they going to be rented weekly? We're going to have Section 8 housing allowed in there? Is that how this is going to go? Or is it going to be a glorified mobile home park? Good. That was very good there, asking that question. Working hours. Uh, road damage. I think I covered everything I wanted to know. But I'd appreciate a little more knowledge because this is my property abutting it. I have a whole lot more property than theirs. I want to know what I can do with mine if it's acceptable for this to happen. Consider me on board with another 100, 150 of these. Or if it's negated, I'll go along with that and just build my couple single family houses out there. One or the other. But thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. My name is Marcy Shumway. I live at 547 School Street. Can you say that um, again, sorry? 547. No, your name? Marcy, Marcy Shumway. Okay. S-H-U-M-W-A-Y. Um, we abut the property. Our whole yard is their driveway. And the back of our property is where their utility building is. So we are affected by it greatly. <laughs> the noise from the traffic going in. Um, the, uh, if it, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, we enjoy when it's, that it's seasonal because from April to, you know, October to April, it's very quiet back there. Right now it's very quiet back there and we're enjoying having some peace in our backyard. Um, I know that's my choice that I live there and I've lived there for 26 years, 27 years, but um, it's always been quiet in the winter and we look forward to that because that's when the foliage between our yard and their parking lot disappears and I'm worried about having it be not just a seasonal property. And, um, and if it is going to be not a seasonal property. My worries are um, when I looked at the paperwork online, it said that golf carts were going to be used because they wanted it to be a green property. So, does that mean that all the vehicles for those units are going to be parked in the parking lot, or are they going to be able to have one at the unit and then use golf carts just to get around the property? Um, my other concern is how it's going to be rented, like the last gentleman. Is it going to be weekly, monthly, for a whole season? And then, again, if it is not just a campground hours or months from, uh, you know, April to October, to me that becomes a mobile home park, too. It's a mini mini homes are the big thing right now so it becomes a mini mobile home park and then the restaurant um, how what will the hours be it's 1700 square feet that's a pretty big restaurant and is it only for the people at the campground during the time that the campground is open or the rentals are open or is it going to be open to the public and then more traffic going in and out past my yard and 
uh, fences, you know, sometimes make good neighbors. <laughs> trying to think about and what is the building behind my house going to be used as is it still going to be used as storage or is it going to be used for more recreational activities um, and then the operating hours right now they, the operating hours were till 8 p.m. is it going to stay that way or is it going to change and then the water use as well the noise from the pickleball court behind our house as well. Um, I'd rather hear the kids playing at the daycare than people screaming playing pickleball in my backyard. <laughs> All right, I think between what the other people said and what I said, I think those are my main concerns. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else come forward, I'm going to close this public hearing. Next is preliminary plan, major subdivision, Goodrich Farm, R40, Lot 4, Zone R3, Durant and Diamond Hill Road, Altus Engineering. Good evening. Uh, for the record, I'm Eric Sowery from Altus Engineering here on behalf of the applicant. Um, there's nothing to report. Uh, nothing has changed on this project at all. Uh, it's the same as it was since the beginning. Um, so I guess we'll just let the public have at it if they're here to speak on it. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no one uh, come up, I'll close this public hearing. Thank you. Next is preliminary plan and conditional use major subdivision, Norman Court, R44, Lot 20, Zone R1, and R2, Civil Consultants. I'm going to recuse myself. <coughs> Hi, my name is Neil Raposa. I'm a Civil Consultant uh, here on behalf of uh, Norman Court LLC. Uh, this uh, plan has not had any substantial changes since uh, the previous presentation uh, beyond some material changes in the piping for the water um, that was reviewed and requested by uh, Maine Water Company. Um, so, uh, take input from the public. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Sarah Ellis. I live at 98 Old Pine Hill Road. I do a butt um, lot one of this property. And um, I've prepared some, I, I spoke last time, but I've, I've prepared more de more detailed and I've handed out some, present some uh, documents and I will send those to Terry um, right after the meeting. So I have five, con I have many concerns, but I'll go through five of them tonight. Um, the first one is that it's, we know that the limitation in R1 and R2 is to 35 feet, but the town also requires new buildings blend in with the surrounding areas um, with existing buildings nearby per the land use ordinance, article 9.8, which says the relationship of proposed buildings to the environment, um, proposed structures shall be related harmoniously to the, to the terrain and to the existing buildings in the vicinity, which have a visual relationship with the proposed buildings. Special attention shall be paid to the bulk, location and height of buildings, and such natural features as slope, soil type, and drainage ways. So this is off, off, off on the east side of Old Pine Hill North, and it's one of the side, small side streets. All of these side streets have single resident, single family houses, and yet they're proposing three-story apartment buildings. 
There are no multifamily apartment buildings on any of these quiet dead end streets. Um, there is uh, this, it, it just doesn't seem to meet with these performance standards. I've also driven extensively through zone two, which is where this is, zone R2, and found no three story buildings. The only three story apartment buildings I've found are in our zone R1 or the village overlay district where this type of dense development seems appropriate and in line with Berwick's comprehensive plan. Um, the developer has indeed built a three-story apartment building at 28 Old Pine Hill Road South. However, that's in Zone R1, and it's built into a hill and is only two stories above grade. Allowing three-story apartment buildings to be built on Norman Court, zone, Court, on Norman Court in Zone R2 will set a precedent that will likely lead to the urbanization of what is supposed to be a transition zone from urban to rural, not supposed to be an urban zone. Finally, I am concerned the developer has sub subdivided this large lot he bought, given half of it to his sister, and he's also expressed interest in buying another property on Norman Court, and I'm concerned that in the future he will try to build additional multifamily apartment buildings on Norman Court if this is allowed. I understand that the way this works is that, that you can ask for conditions, that the planning board can put conditions on the permit, so I would, each of these things, I will leave you with a request of condition. That develop, development either be limited to two-story single-family homes to blend in with the neighborhood, or two-story multifamily buildings to be consistent with other buildings in Zone R2. Also, I would like to hear that the developers not planning to uh, develop additional properties on Norman Court. I don't think that could be a restriction. My second species, my second concern is that the special species of special concern have not been accounted for. Um, the application that was presented in the 921 packet, um, there are two letters from the earlier version from the Vena Court, but they say that from the letter from Marine Department, Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and also from Maine Natural Area Programs. And um, the application states that these letters say there's no, no, no species of concern or habitats on the property. But both letters, which I've included here, I'm not going to quote them. The letters say there are no documented habitats or species of concern. Both letters specifically um, recommend surveys for spicebush. Spicebush is the host plant to the spicebush swallowtail butterfly, which is a species of concern in Maine. And on September 27th, the neighbor and I walked through the proposed development. And we located spicebush on lot one, on lot two, within and, and downhill from the proposed development. So a requested condition is that in fact, these, that surveys are done by state biologists um, for species of concern. And after that, the developer has to be required to follow any resulting state recommendations to protect these species or habitats of concern. My third point is invas about invasive species, invasive plants that are likely to be spread. I think we'll hear another letter from somebody else, but. There are so much Japanese knotwood on Norman Court. I have provided a photo of that, um, uh, photos of that in this document. Um, it's on the right by Coffin Brook. The trucks are going back and forth past there. You can see where they're knock, knocking the pieces off. And that's exactly how knotweed spreads by just, all you need is a little piece of it to be moved around. And it's gonna be dangerous to property owners, buyers, sellers, anyone who lives in the area, and also to the town of Furwick if this has moved around. Um, so I draw your attention to um, the photo on, on page five, uh, sorry, figure five, page 10. And actually going back to the, uh, there is also a diagram, um, figure four, where I've indicated the approximate um, places of spice, spice bush. I forgot to mention that earlier. But this is all in the document for you since I know my time is limited here. Um, the other very big big concern that I have, well, the, the requested condition about the knotweed is that the developer should be required to seek and follow recommendations on how to eradicate it or prevent spreading it between the developer's properties as well as into the town and to abutting properties because it's really horrible stuff to try to eradicate. It can ruin your foundation. My fourth concern is that two of us, that, that, okay, my fourth concern is that lots one and two include documented wetlands and 
and streams, as well as land that is wet and uneven. The plans do in indicate that they're planning to fill 1,272 square feet of wetland on lots one and two. An unknown amount of additional fill is certainly expected because the land is wet and uneven. Um, and there's this, they're also gonna be building the, the parking lot and the uh, over a stream, which they have planned to, they have a stormwater management plan that addresses it, are they gonna put the stream, divert it, put it into a contained drain and move it over towards another wetland. But there's no consideration of our wetland, which belongs to two abutters, the Kinlaws and I, and, 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 and Ellis here. Um, this wetland, may I point to this map? The wetland is visible, our wetland is visible on the C2. It's right under here, it's a designated wetland. In fact, it's a restricted buffer area that I have deeded restrictions that I have to protect this. Um, and it's main DEP, make sure that I keep a restricted buffer area around this. And we're directly downhill from lot one and from lot two. Um, there's no consideration given to this wetland, only to this one. Uh, so uh, the, this wetland has in it, uh, I'm a trained biologist, I've lived here for 18 years. There are breeding grounds for, spring fro for frogs, like spring peepers, wood frogs, gray frogs. It's got hundreds of, gray, hundreds of blue irises and other plants growing on it. I do provide pictures of those. And many birds nest near, nearby and use it as a watering hole. So I'm deeply worried that all the filling of the wetland here, the filling that's expected elsewhere, the diversion of the stream is gonna dry up this wetland that provides valuable habitat and enjoyment for neighbors and abutters, they should not be allowed to affect that. So request a condition there is that the developer should be required to have Maine DEP study how, we, how the filling of the wetland, the planned filling of the wetland, the anticipated fill, and the diversion of the stream. How is that gonna affect the Ellis and Kinlaw wetland? If that study predicts detrimental effects, then plans have to be adjusted to avoid these effects. Also, they're bound to be, I mean, they're clear cutting, there's gonna be lots of grass, Herbicides and pesticides must not be allowed um, uh, because our uh, wetlands are downhill from there. And finally, the, my fifth point is I'm concerned about damage to mature trees. There are some wonderful, wonderful big old trees that are along the property line, along this, along the stone wall here, along the sides of the line, along the sides as well. We have um, documented some of these trees over 100 years old and um, there's a stand of white birches near the back. So a wooded buffer should be allowed to protect these trees along the back. These will also provide a, provide a partial screen, which has been requested by neighbors, and I'm sure it's something that would be good for the property. Um, but you can't cut these trees down, you can't damage them, they're irreplaceable. Any newly planted trees, like put in a couple of pine trees or whatever, it's gonna take decades to recover, recover those. So. The requested condition here is before any clearing of trees begins, clearly mark the trees that must be protected in case so there's no, no miscommunication between the tree cutters and the developer, and leave a wooded buffer on the sides and the backs of the lots to ensure that these mature trees are protected and not killed by the heavy equipment or through excessive cuttings of the root systems. I do thank you for the opportunity to present these concerns and, um, and and also, I guess if you, when you do put conditions on it, are, I'm wondering if we will be informed what conditions there are and will we be kept up to date? Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Earl. <coughs> How you doing? My name's uh, Ed Kinlaw. Uh, I am one of the abutters. Sorry, what was your name again? Ed Kinlaw. Ed Kinlaw, thank you. One of the abutters directly behind this proposed development. Um, I'm not going to go over every single point that Sarah has already uh, presented here, but also share all of her concerns uh, with this development. Um, one of the things that I will reiterate again is that it, the wetland concerns, um, you know, how that's going to affect uh, any of the wildlife in the area, um, as well as asking for a condition to leave a screen along the back of the property as well. Uh, 
some form of foliage or whatever uh, to help with that. Um, the other thing that I would probably ask, and this would be aimed at the folks that live on Norman Court, that one of the things that we have experienced already on Halflinger Lane is that there be some type of uh, traffic control devices put in on Norman Court during the construction as during the current project that's going on on Halflinger. Uh, a lot of the subcontractors and contractors seem to think that our road is a drag strip and they like to treat it as such. So it's a safety concern because we have kids, uh, people that walk in the street. Um, so some thought needs to be given to that as well. And then finally, one of the other concerns that we have is more in the general community sense of this is what is the strain of this going to put on already existing uh, strained uh, things in the community like the schools, police department, uh, fire department, sewer, water. Uh, what's the additional uh, cost that this is going to drive to that? We have kids in the school uh, and again from talking to folks within the police department and also uh, with the school system itself, um, they're already bursting at the seams. Uh, so with the amount of folks that are in here. So we have concerns with the amount of folks that would be brought into the area uh, because of this already taxing uh, the taxed system. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Bobby Johnson. I live on uh, Norman Court. Um, I am an and a butter also, uh, but uh, it's not in my backyard. It's going to be in my front yard. I only see positives for myself and what goes on there, um, and I like to see some uh, new places for sale and for rent. You know, we're a bedroom community. We don't have any industry, so. That is our industry, bedrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have a comment uh, that I had to read into the record before you guys do any re rebuttals or anything. So is this, would you like me to do that now? Yeah. OK, so this uh, was emailed in. It was asked to be read into the public comments section, considerations on the proposed development on Norman Court. As someone who has lived on old, and this is from, uh, oh, I'm going to slaughter that Tenuvial, name. Tenuvial. Okay. So it is exactly how I thought. Tenuvial Sampson, 112 Old Pine Hill Road. As someone who has lived on Old Pine Hill Road for many years, I have some concerns about an apartment building being built in the R2 zoning of Norman Court. One, the proposed site is quite wet with an unnamed stream going through the middle of the building area. Of course, modern engineering can redirect and contain the water, but to what environmental cost? I suspect this area has a year-round seep due to the established flora, mosses, alder, alders, mailberry, and winterberry, some of the plants found in this area. She did include the fancy names, but I'm not going to kill myself with those tonight. Thank you. Um, an aster that appears to be swamp aster is growing in the area designated to become the widened two-laned road. These plants range from FACW, a faculative wetland, to OBL, obligate. I don't think the current mapping of the wetland is accurate and that it should be surveyed by MDEP to determine the actual square footage area of wetlands that will be impacted. Wetland is defined as land areas with soil that is saturated with water either permanently or seasonally. A surprising <coughs> amount of Lindera Benzoin, spice bush seedlings, and young trees are scattered through both plot one and plot two. Spice bush is a plant of special concern at S3 in Maine, with about 14 to 15 native populations in the entire state, most are in York County. Spice bush is the only food source for the spice bush swallowtail and endangered butterfly in Maine. This butterfly is definitely in the vicinity as I have populations of the caterpillars on the spice bush growing in my property a couple houses down. I'm roughly a thousand feet from the spice bush that are on plot one and plot two, likely less as the butterfly flies. The invasive species on Norman Court are of concern. Autumn olive and Japanese knotweed are both prevalent. These are both on the main prohibited plant list. The do not sell list is also sometimes referred to as prohibited plant list or the banned plant list. It is legal to import, export, buy, sell, or intentionally propagate for sale the species listed on the do not sell plant list. 
have not seen anywhere in the proposal a plan for mitigating or removing these plants or a discussion on how their spread will be prevented. Invasive plants are readily transferred by construction vehicles, particularly the Japanese knotweed that can re-sprout from pieces as small as an inch. What are the mitigation plans by the construction company? And what will be the effect of the additional volume of cars on Old Pine Hill Road and Sullivan Street? Old Pine Hill Road is a street that cars routinely go higher than the speed limit, pass on the double yellow line, tailgate, and generally display aggressive driving behavior. It's used as a shortcut by many people to avoid downtown. It's also a road that is narrow with some deep ditches on parts of it. There are many dog walkers, joggers, and children on bikes. The recent apartment building has added to the children in the area. A couple of years ago, a children playing sign was installed, but the speed limit was not reduced on the road. Speed reduction to 25 miles per hour plus a speed hump or stop sign near the library should be considered for the road. With Norman Court being nearly across the street from Sullivan Street, the traffic would likely be increased significantly on Sullivan also. I'm unsure why the speed limit wasn't reduced to 25 miles per hour when Old Pine Hill Road became part of the urban district several years ago. The house density has increased significantly in the past 12 years. As my neighbor across the street who sold his house this summer said to me, my house used to be the second house on the left from School Street, now it's the 25th house. That's the difference a decade makes. It seems that being part of downtown, we should have a downtown speed limit. Where else in the downtown is the speed limit 35 miles per hour? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Irish. All right, seeing no one else coming up, I will close this public hearing. Thank you. Um, next is the first public comment. This is for any non-agenda uh, issues. Okay, I'll close that. Uh, next is approval of minutes uh, for September 7th and 21st. So we don't have a quorum for either of those. So we're going to have to move those to the next meeting. Nope. Okay. All right, next is old business, conditional use, Beaver Dam Campground, 551 School Street, R53, Lot 13A, Welsh Engineering. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I'll try to address the comments that were yep, brought up. Please, thank you. Um, Mr. Van Dusen had several comments. One is um, his concern about it becoming a mobile home park. Um, I think uh, Irish can talk to this as well, but mobile home parks are not allowed in that district. It can't be done. This is a campground. It's a campground now, and it's going to remain a campground. That's the plan. That is the master plan. Uh, what you see here is the master plan. Um, I don't think it's any different than, than that. Um, units will be rented on a daily and a weekly basis. Um, there's no plan to have people live here year round, but as I guess that was the insinuation, but that, that's not the plan. This is a campground and will be rented as such. Um, uh, Mr. Kathios had several comments, um, talked about the buffer quite a bit. Um, there presently is um, some roads. And, you know, a little pointer here. There presently are some units that the buffer runs right on the towards the back side of those units over there, the 250 foot buffer. So the vernal pool is right there, and if you measure out 250 feet, we've pulled all of those units outside of that 250 foot buffer. We're improving the situation. Um, the environmental study that you'll see recommends planting those areas in, within the 250, and we will do that. We will plant the, there's some, there's a road and a couple of units that are within that space. So we're pulling those back and making that situation better. Um, he indicated there was 2,000 feet of uh, sewer that goes through the buffer. There's, there's nothing in the buffer. I, I, don't, I don't know. There is sewer being built out here, absolutely on the site, but it's not within the buffer area. Um, so 
Um, the restaurant will have 90 seats in it. That's what that will have. That was one of the questions. Um, the septic system will be and is being designed and permitted and approved through the DHHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, as an engineered system. It will have a tertiary treatment system with it as well. And what that does is it treats the effluent before it's discharged into the leach bed. Um, it brings a higher level of treatment than a normal septic system would do. Um, and those that that system will be will be located right there. It's going to serve the it's going to serve the site. It's going to serve everything here. It's going to serve all the camp all the campers in the restaurant and the office building. Um, there we have developed an erosion control plan, and that's part of that package that I said that we have submitted. So you will see that in there. Um, we have an erosion control plan for all of the construction out here, and you will you'll see that. Um, the units are campers. They're going to be on wheels. They're the fun. There's a definition of a camper, and that's what they're going to be. Um, the, again, talked about the mobile home park um, in Section 8. But this is a, it's going to be a, a, a campground, and that's, that's what it's going to be. Um, Ms. Shumway had a couple of comments. Um, ask where the parking will be. So what we have done here is we do have the parking lot out front. And the way we anticipate this working is that all of the units will be serviced by golf carts. I talked about it this at the last meeting. There's an area right here we have overflow parking. And we've accounted for 30 spaces right there. I, I don't think they're going to be necessary, but, but the code requires it or the, the ordinance requires it. So. We have enough space right here to do 30 parking spaces. Um, so primarily this area is going to be used. If there is some reason for that, um, this area will be the overflow section for parking. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Walsh, may I interrupt for a moment? Yeah. Um, if I understood her, uh, Ms. Shumway's concern correctly, it's the fact that there's going to be golf carts used in the park but the parking is also in the park. So how do you anticipate the car is getting from in, into the overflow parking and out, and how are you going to prevent those cars from going to the, to the, to the uh, individual lots, I think is her concern. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the staff's gonna have to direct these people to park here, I think, when we have that situation. There is a, there is a road, I'm gonna call it a road, there's, a, there's an emergency access road, if you will, that runs down through here. So that will be a, a road that can support traffic and, and park the cars. Mm -hmm. They're all going to be concentrated right here, right beyond the right beyond the building. Okay. So I think I think your other statement just answered her the, what I understood to be her concern. Just wanted to make sure you cleared it up. Sure. Um, I think I said before rentals will be probably on a daily or weekly basis here. That was one of the other questions. Um, we are, and again, I'll make this point, we're actually reducing the number of units here. We're reducing it by 20 units overall than what exists there today. Um, so there's actually going to be a reduction of use on this site. We're reducing the impervious by over two acres on this site. We're pulling out of the 250-foot buffer. Um, we're creating a septic system that is adequate for this site. Um, and will treat effluent properly. Um, I, all of those things to me seem like a positive. Um, there was one thing about the pickleball, and you'll, you'll see this in the in the information that you get. We are putting up a, a fence, a ten foot fence, and putting plantings along that side on the on the abutter side of the property, and that is in the in the new submission that we that we put forward. So. Uh -huh. There was a question about the hours of the restaurant. I don't know those hours. I'm going to have to talk okay. to. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that answer to you next time. Okay. I just I don't know um, what what and their intention is. Primarily, it's going to be for use of the public, right? Uh, not of the people in the campground. I yes. believe. It's going to be it's open. Not open. Is it open to the public? Yes, but okay. but I don't think it'll be. Um, <clears throat> I, I think primarily it's going to be people in the in the campground that okay. are using it. So I got a couple questions. I'm sorry if it's in here and I missed it. Sure. Um, 
my question is about, you know, I heard somebody talk about, you know, it becoming a glorified trailer park, and that was one of my concerns initially as well. So um, my question is, um, these are going to be seasonal, or are these going to be year-round? They'd like to possibly do them year-round. Yeah, it's going to see what the market and stuff see what the, the yeah, see what the market and what about um, so th these are going to be all short term rentals yeah and uh, are you going to are you renting sites or are you actually putting the park models in and renting those the park models yeah okay yeah and renting those but it's sh all short term rentals it's no right they're not going to be signing two year leases one year leases with people and living there. I don't believe so. I think they're short term, but I can I'll get that clarified for you. I, I, miss, I suppose somebody could rent it for the season if they want it. Well, the season is one thing; a year is another thing. Right. You know, right. because for me, you know, it's it's not unreasonable for somebody to rent a camper for the season. Right. That's, I, I know guess that's many people that do that. Right. Um, but when you start signing a one year lease, then I think that's where it, it, you're dancing on that edge of. Yeah, understood. Does it become a glorified right. trailer park? Understood. So I, I think for me, and I don't know if I can require this or not, but I, I would like to see some language in there to to specifically spell that out that this is not going to yep. turn into long term. That's lease. reasonable. Yeah. Um, and then the other. Uh, so you can answer about the seasonal. So the, the pickleball. Court, because I know we have someone here who lives right near there. Um, one of the concerns I have with the, you say that you're going to put a fence in plantings, is that, um, you know, I guess what standard, I would ask this to Irish and maybe Hannah, what standard can we hold them to to ensure that the noise is not um, disturbing surrounding neighbors? Well, the town does have a noise ordinance, so they would even if it's pickleball which is an approved thing on the site plan they still have to conform to the noise performance standards which means more 15 minutes continuous heard outside of the property at certain there's all kinds of verbiage just and i don't have it in front of me but <coughs> they they'll be held to that with the pickleball just as so, well the, as so there is state. recourse for a, absolutely uh, and a butter a neighbor yeah. if if it becomes a nuisance absolutely okay. absolutely is and trust me i know i will get the calls if there is an issue and bill knows that his clients will get the calls from me if there is an issue so i think that i think those are my uh my big issues the seasonal you know see some language about the you know no more than like a seasonal rental yeah like three months well, even if, if the season is April to October, you know, whatever the season is, I think that a, you know, a seasonal lease, non, you know, non so like six sort of, months, yeah. some sort of time limit on that. Yeah. Yeah. I think a time limit is probably more important than just saying seasonal because you could have a snowmobiling well, I mean, season, right. 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 so, right. you know, four months less or less or right. three months or less or something to that effect. Right. I, I think that, you know, a campground would probably be a, you know, two six-month leases potential, right? If, you might have the people that want to come up and snowmobile and right. hunt or whatever, you know, whatever yeah. they do in the wintertime here. I don't think that would be a fish. problem. I'll certainly talk to the, to the owners about that, but that seems pretty reasonable to me. Could even be a and it month. seems to take away that idea that people are going to yeah. stay there. Because mm -hmm. yeah. honestly, that was my big concern as yeah. well. So I understood. I think that that's a happy. It's, yeah, we need some kind of language because I've seen campgrounds in other areas become what we don't want this to become. If I, if I may, if it uh, appeases the, the board and the abutters any, we do in our land use ordinance actually have the definition of campground, <laughs> just the wrong distance for whether the glasses should be on or off, and the camp definition for campground actually states an area or tract of land to accommodate two or more parties in temporary living quarters including but not limited to tents, recreational vehicles, or other shelters. They would not be allowed to sign a one-year lease. That is not a temporary living arrangement. Okay. That is a permanent living arrangement. So they can only rent daily, weekly, monthly, seasonally, but they cannot do annual because that takes it out of the temporary housing and then it becomes a violation and I have to go in there and... Yeah, I, th I think that that's pretty vague and I'd like to see yeah. something more specific the, I'd like uh, to see the verbiage a little stricter too, yeah. in not only in that but in the in the ordinance yeah, would be nice. If I, th I think my specified. big thing would be, you know, I'm okay with seasonal if it's a six month. 
is considered the summer season, the winter season, yeah. but non-consecutive leases or something would would probably satisfy my. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I was looking to see if there was anything in the ordinance itself that specified that or not. That may be something sure. that they because I don't see anything in there. Yeah, I got a question. It was brought up. I think we talked about this the first time this was proposed to us. These units will not be placed on a slab. Is that correct? They're going to be on tires so be, to be campers. But there's they have no to be. concrete slab on That's correct. Unit. Okay. Yep. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. And so just that you said that. Again, because I do think I've heard that twice that there is a slab and that there isn't a slab. So there is no you slab. Just say there will be no. No slab. Slabs. The units will have their tires still on and setting on the ground. Gravel. Gravel. Gravel, Gravel. ground. Thank you. That was brought up the first Thank you. time this was presented. Another concern was just uh, screening near the uh, road uh, with one of the abutters, the entrance. It seemed like she was saying her house is right there. Yeah, right there. Um, yeah, I mean, we can look at that and, and look at adding some, some plantings in there. I okay. think um, I and don't just quite, can't quite remember what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Irish? Again, it's covered in the land use ordinance. Campsites shall be laid out and screened in such a manner that none are within view from public roads, navigable rivers, existing residences, or approved subdivision lots. Any combination of evergreen planting, lamps, landscaped earthen berms, or solid fencing may be used to achieve screening standard when campsites would otherwise be visible from the locations described above. So again, covered in the land use ordinance, they have to comply. Well, I, I think that the I think, that's two different subjects. Residences, so. I think that's two different subjects because I think that when you're talking about screening where the pickleball courts are, that would be screening also the campground from the abutters. And I think what you just asked was the drive, the entrance. Yeah, right the near the right. entrance, it seemed right. like right next to the house. Basically. And I don't know if that's really a reasonable request, but I think that I just want to clarify the difference so between what she just read and what. It, that's for the campground, but this is um, right. And I get that. Time when the leaves are yeah. down. Yeah. Okay. So hold on. The the public comment is done. Mm -hmm. So right now it's just us talking and discussing. Um, the issue being the screening. The there. Hannah, you could probably answer this a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, they could add trees to that to screen it as a buffer. Um, it's not like we're asking for a fence. I mean, this place already is existing, so it's not like this is a new subdivision where new things like screening is needed. Um, but this would be kind of like that happy medium mix of just adding a couple trees type of thing. Yes. We're, we're talking about the, the entrance. Yeah, road, up into the right. parking lot. Because it looks like it's already wooded right there. Just to kind of add to it. Yeah. I, I wonder if <clears throat> the definition of what part of the campground is visible or not visible. Are we talking all the way to Route 9 where you can see the road or only where the sites are? So if the concern is that the parking lot can be seen is that part of the campground that needs to be screened so that it can't be seen or more along the lines of the buildings and the campsites so as it is right now that this place has already been here before the land use ordinance even if the parking lot shouldn't have to be screened the issue would be the mobile units I mean if you drive down school street right now you're just get basically see you'd have to go slow to see the buildings but you can drive by and see the parking lot. Um. I, I think that my opinion is that the, the more important thing is to screen the piece. The parking lot, I, I agree with you, I don't think is uh, a required thing to screen that parking lot. But I think that all of the buildings, and particularly, I hate to keep going back to it, but that pickleball court, I think that I'm really concerned about the noise from that pickleball court and 
you know, seeing seeing some um, evergreen trees there that just grab a plant with a hat. Evergreen. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Evergreen trees, shrubs, and bushes are a very good sound dampening thing. Mm -hmm. Our performance standards for campgrounds and tenting grounds only specifies camp sites laid out within need screening. And there is a definition for the um, recreational vehicles that the board may want to be aware of when they're asking them these questions. A vehicle or vehicular attachment designed to be towed for temporary sleeping or living quarters for one or more persons, which is not a dwelling, and which may include a pickup camper, travel trailer, tent trailer, camp trailer, or motorhome. In order to be considered as a vehicle, not as a structure, the unit must remain with its tires on the ground, must be roadworthy, i.e. possess current registration sticker from any state division of motor vehicles. So the park models have to be kept up, maintained, and kept on their wheels, and they are specifically, they're specified as not for living. So if anybody were to try and break that regulation, then it would be a code violation of our ordinance, and I'd be able to intervene. Okay. But it, it does not specify anything in here about, A, a definition of temporary, and B, anything about uh, any sort of parking screening for campgrounds, just about the campsites themselves. So, if I could? No, nope. no. Nope. Please read these. No, nope. no, nope. okay. no. Nope. contradicts what you're saying. Public comment is over. Okay. You can talk to me after if you need to. So the the um, the black dots that are here are the survey located trees that we we, we located those along the ways. So these darker green ones here would be the screening. So pickleball court, ten foot high fence, and then this is a section of it. So pickleball court. 10 foot high fence and evergreen plantings behind that. I suspect there'll be arborvitaes or white pines that'll go in behind that. Um, Do you know if they intend that to just be a solid fence or if they intend on using some of that uh, dense fiber pack stuff that the noise idea was just a solid fence? Just, just a solid fence, solid okay. Fence probably. Mm -hmm. Just curious. But, yep. They they have have. Did you do a uh, sight line for the neighbors? Yeah. When you determine the screening, because I think that I think that there's two things going on here. One is a screening for the sound from the pickleball court, yep. and the other one is to make sure that there's screening from the campground to the abutters. And I think that you know, in, in my my experience, you know, I've seen uh, sightline views where you know they uh, they map out like the neighbor's house, and they say what can the neighbor see, and they make sure that that screening covers. What the neighbor can see from their property. Yeah, there is. Um, I think the neighbors that will see this are on this, this, on this side, right? And there is. These are these dark. Um, so that's going to be a continuous. Are those those trees. actually exist? That that mm -hmm. those trees all exist there. Yeah. So it's actually a pretty good screen buffer that's there. Okay. And where we're adding in, where those pickleball courts are right there, is where that, that evergreen hedge will be will be set in behind that as well. Here's, I, I think from I think my challenge, and I think some of my board members probably share the challenge, is that you know this is an existing campground and it has been here for a long time. Um, but when you do a major overhaul like this, I think that you know it's not unreasonable for us to uh, hear the public and say, you know, what do we want? What do we want to happen? Sure. Like it's like it's new. I think that you've with the with the sound screening and the screening of the trees. I I think that where you know I think that's where we where we would like it to be. Yep. Uh, I do. You know I did make my point clear that you know if this pickleball court becomes a nuisance, I want you know the code enforcement officer to be able to do something because I know I would not like that in my backyard. Again, it guess there right. They've got to just to keep their guests happy. They're gonna they're gonna have to be cognizant of it. Yeah, I mean, how the noise ordinance is set up is it has to be 15 minutes of continuous sound, so it'd be very difficult to say that yeah. they're they're making that much sound. Yep. Um, it's not like it. If you hit a ball, there's a pause. You hit a ball. That's not consecutive, right? So, I think it, the screening is well adequate to what the ordinance says. I think you guys have gone above and beyond um, in issuing that concern. 
um, as a ordinance issue and as a, uh, a good neighbor. Um, that was pretty much it. Uh, the, like you said earlier, the erosion and sediment control, you have more information on that. There's a whole plan in that yeah. package, so you're going to see this, you're going to see that, that other stuff, you're going to see the parking, um, mm -hmm. you're going to see the snow storage. Mm -hmm. um, that was the, the items. So just to maybe sum up the some of the questions about the restaurant, um, you're looking at 90 seats. Yes. You're not sure the hours just yet, whether it's going to be breakfast, lunch, dinner, or one or two or three of those. I, I, I think it's all three of those because it'll, it'll serve us the, the camp. So it'll be open all day. Right. So you're, yeah. you're some, all right. So right. maybe we can get that clarified. Yep. Um, and it is open to the public. Yes. And parking has been... Um, Considered for the restaurant as well as the campground. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to get those couple of things clarified. Thank you. Yeah, you'll see that in the package. Yep. And just to, just to, I, I know the answer to this, but I just like to get it uh, spoken. Um, I know that some abutters raised concerns about the uh, the septic design of the leach field. But I'm confident that you have an engineered plan that's adequate for the spaces that we're going to have in the uh, the restaurant and the Absolutely. 90 seat restaurant. Yep, yep. As I said, it, there's a whole another process we have to go through with the state to even permit that. Um, we've had a preliminary meeting with them, talked through the the idea, the concept, and showed them a, a conceptual plan, and they're they're in favor of it, and we're actually glad to see that it was being improved from what what is there today. Any other questions, concerns? You guys all set? I have the noise ordinance in front of me if you... Okay, if you can, let's, let's read it out. So, the maximum permissible sound pressure level of any continuous, regular, or frequent source of sound produced by any activity shall be limited by the time period in land use district listed below. Sound levels shall be measured at least four feet above ground at the pro property boundary. So we're talking, you know, reasonable height, right. property boundary. For residential districts between 7 a.m and 10 p.m. on a decibel scale of 60 and from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. 50. The level specified may be exceeded by 10 decibels for a single 15 minute period per day. Noise shall be measured by a meter set on the A-weighted response scale, slow response. So it even lays out how we have to test it. No person shall engage in activities on a site abutting any residential use between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. which exceed those limits established for residential districts. Otherwise, the following activities shall be exempt from those regulations. Um, so, ca construction and maintenance activities con conducted between 7 and 10. Sounds emanating from safety signals, warning devices, emergency pressure reliefs, valves, and other emergency activities are always an exception. And sounds emanating from traffic on public transportation facilities. So, it's all laid out not only what they're allowed to do, when they're allowed to do it, but how we have to test for it mm -hmm. if there's complaints. So, good to go. Are these, Thank you. I have a question. Uh, are these courts lighted? Um, right now we haven't shown any lights on them. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I'm assuming they'll close the courts. They'll have certain hours. Yeah. In the courts. I, yeah, again. Because yeah. I'd like to see some kind of hours if you have them. All right. I'll, I'll ask the yeah. clients about that. Don't look at me. I'm all out of things. Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. <laughs> no, I've looked up everything I thought that the board might need to consider to make their comments to Mr. Walsh or respond to the public. Okay. Yeah, so if you could give me the answers on that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving along. Uh, preliminary plan, major subdivision, Goodrich Farm, R40, Lot 4, Durant and Diamond Hill Road, Altus Engineering.
evening. Good evening again. For the record, once again, Eric Sowery uh, from Office Engineering on behalf of the applicant. Um, as I indicated before, nothing's changed. So I guess it's at the board's pleasure. Right. You don't have any pickleball courts, do you? No pickleball <laughs> courts. <laughs> I tried. I tried, but they didn't really want it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, there's no public uh, comment at the public hearing. Um, all the waivers have already been granted. Um, is there any issues, Hannah or no. uh, uh, Irish? Do you have any issues? No, this one's pretty straightforward. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The motion we approve the preliminary plan. We find it complete. Or we'll find it complete. Yes. I think we've already done that. Um, I think we just, did. Yeah, we're just approving the preliminary plan. Yeah. Okay. Approving the preliminary plan. Okay. That's fine. All right. I'll second. Um, further discussion? All in favor? Okay. And then, do we do the final as well? No, not yet. Okay. Can we do the final? Is that possible? <laughs> I mean, the plan's not going to change. Please hold. Please hold. <laughs> Next available brain cell will be with the you. The ordinance may not allow for them on the same yeah. day, but let me check. Since yeah. there's nothing that the board wants changed. Right, but. right. That's. Yeah. It's, it's really straight, that straightforward. Yeah, it's that straightforward, yeah. 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 Finally, an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> I wish they were all this easy. Yeah. Uh, but then they wouldn't need us. That's good. That's good too. Okay, so I'll make a motion. Um, was it, um, to, approve to approve the final plan. Okay, uh, pending uh, findings of facts, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I'll second that motion. Okay, for the discussion. I, I just wanted to ask um, <laughs> that we're not jumping the gun again on approving things without having everything in front of us. I mean, I know that we need to have documents presented ahead of time so that we can review them before a meeting. We need to have plans in front of us that need to be looked at and signed when the vote is made. We don't have that. He's not ready for that tonight. We have it. He doesn't uh, have it. Well, we don't, he doesn't have the plans. But we don't he's always already, have the sign. We yeah, don't always have the one do. for them to sign. They they typically don't bring them that night for right. final approval. For final right. approval, they typically they don't, don't bring the copy that is stamped the, for the board. Yeah, to they sign. don't bring the the final plan that's approved because we might require changes tonight. If there are any exactly. conditions of approval that okay. the board puts on it, so if, they if would we have don't to make any changes, to sign it. then they just yeah. bring that plan. That yep, it's the same plan that they brought the forward at the beginning. Okay, so you learn as I go. Oh yeah, so you were. You were actually provided with that information, so that literally there's been no changes. So your yeah, original yeah, package. The plan looks great. I have okay. nothing wrong with the plan. I was going to say you did sure receive your package. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I, it had nothing to do okay. with the project itself. Yeah, I just, just wanted to procedure. make procedurally yeah. that yeah. I understood how it works. If there's any question about anything to change, totally right. But since the board has no concerns, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. 
I retract my discussion. And we double, <laughs> and we double checked on the ordinance, both yeah. of us right here. So yeah, yeah there's all nothing right. that precludes that. All right. All in favor? Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Yeah. All right. Moving along, preliminary plan and conditional use, Malloy Brook, Major Subdivision, School Street and Heritage Drive, R49, Lot 3, Atar Engineering. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yep, yeah, Irish. We were both looking away at the moment. It was unanimous. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trying to take good notes so we don't have to watch the whole video because you guys only have to live it for three and a half hours. We have to live it for seven. So <laughs> we're trying to make good notes here. Hey, we try and not have three and a half hour meetings. I know, but just in case. <laughs> Unless MMA gives you the wrong time on a video. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hopefully you get the mic tall enough for me. Uh, for the record, Mike Sudak, Atar Engineering, here on behalf of SOW Solar Incorporated. I have Kevin Hill, my client, here with me in the audience tonight. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to guess a brief brief overview is in order. This is our first preliminary uh, hearing or preliminary application review. So if it pleases the board, I can quickly go over. Yes, please. Okay. Um, so this should look exactly the same from our sketch review back in July. We had our site walk in the middle of August. Um, so what you're looking at here is the overall, overall parcel, 67 acres, but the majority of what we're affecting, and I'm going to use my pointer here, is 12 acres um, up front, if you will, is the dual frontage lot, School Street here in the bottom right, and Heritage Drive uh, over top of it. Um, and back in 2021, the Planning Board approved a solar farm in the rear of the property, about 11 acres for that occupied area. We're staying well away from that, but just need to show the overall parcel as it is. Okay, so what we're taking a look at here uh, is a seven lot uh, conventional subdivision, so not a cluster development. Uh, conventional lots, so 60,000 square foot upland area minimum. Um, all frontage lots, six of them we're proposing off of Heritage Drive, the seventh we're proposing off of School Street. Um, all of the existing conditions from sketch review have carried forward. Our high intensity soil survey, our vernal pool uh, that has been confirmed to be significant, this dark hatch up here in the top, which is going to limit um, the building envelopes, uh, the developed area within these first three lots, we're effectively going to deed restrict their backyards just to make sure we're not impacting that critical terrestrial setback. Um, rest of the property below those three lots is all open farmland, as you remember from the site walk. Um, private on-site utilities for both, uh, individual wells, individual septic systems. We have a blanket of test pits. Um, everything should be in compliance there. Um, let's see. I think that concludes my summary. Um, there's some comments from Hannah's memo that I'd be happy to go through, um, but I can feel any questions if the t board has any first. Go for it. Okay. Uh, when do you want me to? If you want, to, you can say it first, that and then he can. Uh... I was going to go to you first anyway. So. Okay. Well, before before the board gets too far, this has there has been a lot, as you guys know, you've been receiving a lot of legal stuff. So I want to wanted to go to the town attorney to see where we were at here. Um, so after some back and forth with the town attorney, he said the board has. Um, okay. So what I what I was asking him is basically. Are you guys supposed to be reviewing the legal stuff that we supply you because we do give you everything that we receive? Um, if, if that's something you're supposed to take into consideration, um, or if you're just supposed to consider the statement from DEP. Um, and he said that the board has to review this, this application strictly for our zoning ordinances to see if it complies, that because DEP has weighed in and even Apparently, had they ultimately decided not to, um, that the board has to determine it through the land use, and the parties will, the two parties involved, uh, will have to determine after any approval, if an approval is in fact ultimately given to this project, 
they'll have to d do their legal things outside. Um, so basically, uh, you guys can add, you have the authority to add a condition of approval if you choose to approve the application that requires a DEP stormwater permit prior to the issuance of any building permits or certificates of occupancy. And the board must apply the standards in the town ordinances and does not apply the DEP regulations, although you can add those DEP regulations as a condition of approval. So when you guys are reviewing this, although you've received a lot of legal back and forth in there, um, you guys are still just reviewing it for the land use ordinance. Anything beyond that is for the parties in the courts. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Irish. That's got to make sure my board has the the guidance from the attorneys. That's <coughs> yeah. Protect my board members. No, as early as possible. We appreciate it too. Um, okay, <coughs> so that was the first of three items that I had to discuss. The other two are from Hannah's staff memo. Um, I can go through those quickly. Um, she caught two different uh, concerns within your ordinance um, that I had either missed or didn't know apply for the, for this one. Um, the first of which is a provision, I'm going to grab my pointer again, uh, within your subdivision regulations. Um, and I'm going to do my best to be brief with this, but please give me the hook if I'm going on for too long. Um, so specifically regarding, it's within your traffic control section um, for lots that abut um, or have frontage along an existing or proposed arterial street, which in our case is School Street. Um, we have to declare on the plan and we have to declare in the deed that their direct vehicular access cannot come from the arterial street. <coughs> um, and we have two such lots that apply. We have lot six and lot seven. It is not an issue for lot six because that has dual frontage and we're proposing to have its direct access come off Heritage. It is an issue for lot seven um, and I'm going to put a pin in that for a moment to switch into the second item that Hannah brought up, which was one of our waiver, waiver requests. Um, we're requesting two, we were requesting two. Um, one of them for plan scale, which we are still requesting. The other one was for uh, relief from your land use ordinance dimensional requirements, um, specifically your minimum lot width. Uh, the requirement's 150 feet, and we had two instances, the rear of lot seven here that I'm highlighting and the rear of lot six that I'm highlighting. We are requesting relief of 10 feet for both, down 140 feet. Uh, Hannah informed me that for conventional subdivisions, you don't have the authority to grant that relief, just for clustered, clustered only. So, um, and if I can get a little bit off script, I know Terry dropped off a supplemental packet in your well, a supplemental item in your packet. Um, basically, what we're up against is um, I brought up lot six and seven two separate times with both of those issues. And really, the only way that we can proceed forward is to remove lot seven from consideration. Um, its frontage is exclusively on an arterial, which its driveway can't come off of. And there really is no way. Um, to get 150 feet of minimum lot width without putting any of the other lots into a state of nonconformance. So I'm going to flip a couple pages here. Again, this was just put in your packets this evening. I, I do apologize for that. I, I really try to, um, to not have that happen because I like you guys to be as prepared as I am. Um, but just catching this in uh, Hannah's staff memo when I was taking a look at it today. This this really seemed like the only way for us to move forward this evening. Um, so the yellow highlighted line there that you see, that is the lot lines of lots five and six based on the application as it was submitted. So what you guys have had for the entire length of your review. Um, effectively, what I'm proposing is to extend this rear yard line of lot six extended further north by 10 feet, creating 150 feet, makes lot six compliant. Um, and then in order to keep lot five compliant, the rear yard of that has to be pushed further back just so I still have 60,000 square feet of upland, make it a, make it a conforming lot. Um, those two changes and axing lot seven. So 
that's what I have before you. Um, I, I really think that's the the only way that we can proceed forward. Um, so, if you have any questions to that, otherwise, I would I would consider this the uh, the iteration we'd like to to proceed forward with. Thank you. Okay. And if you ladies have any comments as well. No questions. No, that okay. satisfies my comments. Okay. Do you have anything, Irish? I also have half sizes of the colors that I've applied here, just in case anyone else wants a closer look. Yeah, could I get one of those? Sure. <laughs> I don't have to. The glasses are going like Yeah, I'm, I'm like, it don't matter. I'm blind too far that way. Anyway. I may have a moment to look. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't think any, unless anything jumps out at me. There's enough for the board members too, if you'd like me to play middleman. Do you guys want a copy? <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. So the removal of lot seven that just adds more green space. Yeah. So all of the um, really, really all of the the changes throughout the plan set that would be affected by this would just be you're absolutely right. Our open space calculation open space, yeah. instead of retaining about 44 and a three quarters acres, we're up close to 46 now okay. for retained open space. Uh, obviously, the density calculation isn't affected because we're improving it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, our, our total disturbed area goes down because we remove the considerations of Lot 7's footprint. So, yep. okay. So, and then yes. we have, we're going to approve the preliminary plan on this. We have not approved it yet, or have we? We are going for completeness. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't have any questions. For, forgot to have that at the, the tail end of my introduction. The request, <laughs> the request this evening's preliminary completeness scheduling of the public hearing. We're yes. still um, one meeting away from preliminary approval. Thank you, though. So I would say the, the changes that have been presented tonight do not affect the completeness. Yes, right. um, they, I guess, make it more complete than it was when they first submitted since they weren't able to satisfy those two. Okay. Yeah, the two things they weren't satisfied before. Um, so this makes them more complete than they okay. were when they first. Submitted. How does it make it more complete if we don't have the plan with showing the six lots versus the seven lots? Because when they first submitted, they had requested a waiver that isn't actually a waiver. Um, so this fixes that. And then, um, what's the other one? Oh, just just the the lot access off of the other, off of School Street. Okay. Again, just yeah. couldn't happen. Also, um, so they could not be found complete without satisfying those two things. Gotcha. Is this if that makes and sense. we and we can't grant them. No. Yes. No. That would be a variance. Grant. Yes, there would have to be a variance in order to get around the lot width, since it's a dimensional requirement. The board cannot grant waivers for dimensional requirements. You can only grant waivers for submission requirements. So there are other waivers request for um, a different plan scale, which is a specific submission requirement. You can waive that, but you cannot waive the okay. lot size, the lot width, setbacks, those kinds of things. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yep. Um, question to either you or Hannah. Is that the waiver request that we are Still requesting is that something that the planning board can, can process this evening? When when does that take place? Yes, that yeah. tonight. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. before they find it complete, whether that's today or next meeting, you have to choose to okay. grant or not yeah. the waiver for the plan scale. So let's talk about that waiver real quick. Subdivision Ordinance Seven Point Two Point C Plan Set Scale. <clears throat> I'd be happy to provide a brief summary. Yeah, please. Yeah. So um, for I believe it's for subdivisions. Or for developments that are on an, on less than 100 acres, um, please correct me if I'm if I'm mistaken. There, uh, the plan set scale maximum is supposed to be an inch equals 100 feet. Um, 
the geometry of this parcel, you, you see it here even on an angle. Um, it takes up most of the page. It's a 67 acre parcel, um, and it's a rather long parcel. So I had to, in order to adequately show the whole parcel and all of my lovely general notes, um, we had to go an inch equals 120 feet. So that's what we're requesting. Okay. And, and that is just for this this page. Everything else is, I believe, an inch equals 60 or something well okay. within. And you're OK with that, Anna? OK. I make a motion we approve the waiver. Okay. I second it. OK. Further discussion? All in favor? OK. Waiver granted. Thank you. Uh, next is just for completeness. Just as a, a comment, I'd like to say I uh, appreciate the um, the engineer taking the fact that they can't meet the ordinance into consideration and simply removing the lot as the right thing to do. It's probably not what your client wanted, but um, yeah, I'm probably going to get beaten up a little bit for that. Yeah, <coughs> but uh, but it is the right thing to do as opposed to trying to squeeze something in that can't be squeezed in. Yeah, I mean, you know. It'd be a heck of a lot of a headache that I think would involve re-engaging the DOT to, to move the gravel drive for the solar array, which I am not inclined to yeah, you don't do, want to con touch con that. considering <laughs> what that one took. No. So, yeah, I, I do appreciate the kind words, though. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll make a motion that uh, we find this application complete. I'll second that motion. Okay, further discussion? All in favor? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next is the public hearing. Um, so this is the so schedule. Is the next meeting too early? The ever, the ever so quiet Terry is finally speaking <laughs> up. <laughs> I would say November 2nd. November 2nd. Correct. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay. November 2nd it is. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right, you moving ladies. along. Uh, pre preliminary plan and conditional use major subdivision Norman Court R44 lot 20 civil consultants. I'm going to recuse myself. All right, thank you, Russ. <laughs> Hi, once again, Neil Raposa, some consultants, uh, on behalf of Norman Court LLC. Um, tonight we're requesting preliminary approval for this project. Um, we've gone through a couple public hearings now. I don't know if it'd be easiest. It sounds like, I mean, Sarah's uh, document was very well put together, and I could just go through the, the conditions that she had listed and respond to those if it okay. pleases the board. That, that works. Yeah. Okay, um, for the first. Uh, Requested condition would be that it would be either a two single family house or um, yeah, either a two single family house to blend in with the neighborhood or two story multifamily buildings to be consistent with other buildings in zone R2. Uh, as as it's uh, proposed, it is it does meet the height requirements of the zone, and we did um, make an effort. Uh, there is an effort to, to pull the, the the larger buildings back uh, as far as we can without uh, without creating a lot of uh, environmental impact, and that was also kind of uh, a thought in keeping this a single family uh, house lot out front as a kind of a second layer of screening. So this would be single family house lot, and the development in the back here really isn't uh, particularly visible to the public road. It's all on the private right of way, and as I said, we do we. We're sure to keep the building heights down to the maximum for the allowed in the zone. Um, the second item um, was the developer should not agree to uh, agree not to develop additional properties on Norman Court. I don't think that's um, a legal condition that can be put on it, but it's also everything that any other work that would have to be done here would have to come back for a whole another whole another review in front of the planning board. So we'd be doing this whole process again. So. I don't think that one is a, is a worry. Um, and for it to approved by the planning board, uh, official state biologists for habitats and species of concern should be required. <coughs> After that, developers should re be required to follow any resulting state recommendations to protect species habitats of concern. Um, as was brought up, uh, the spice bush would probably be the the, the main uh, the main biological concern on this lot. 
Uh, and if the locations that, that Sarah had noted here were uh, down in this back area, up against this wetland here, and down on the slope, um, uh, the developer would be agreeable to having uh, a biologist come back out and, and map those locations uh, as a condition of approval uh, and treat them you know, as, as recommended. Uh, for the most part, it's they do thrive uh, closer to the wetlands, so that's uh, most likely why uh, the one that was noted was down by this wetland here uh, and down on this slope, which we are trying to stay out of completely and keep that undisturbed. Uh, so I don't think that would be an issue as far as the development itself, and we could take uh, take measures to protect those as a condition. Before construction is allowed, um, oh, we missed one. Before the construction begins, developers should be required to seek and, and follow recommendations from state biologists how to eradicate the knotweed and prevent spreading uh, between the developer's properties, as well as to abut abutters' properties in the town of Berwick. I know the developer also doesn't want to deal with knotweed. Uh, it is a nuisance, um, but anything that's that's found on site, an effort will be taken to take care of it. But I'm not sure how much it can be, uh, it can be legislated that it, you can prevent it from spreading across the town. It's it's something that's, as the owner will be maintaining and you know maintaining ownership of of the development. It's something that he's going to want to keep a minimum, just inherently. Mm -hmm. Before construction is allowed, developers should be required to have. Main DEP study out filling the wetland on lots one and two, anticipated fill of remaining land and containment and diversion of the stream on lot two will affect the Ellis Kinlaw wetland. Um, that one is uh, in kind of inherently covered by submitting to the DEP for permit by rule. Um, we did do that, we submitted that, and we also, excuse me, uh, we did also go kind of take uh, an extra step to provide the um, the previous paver uh, parking area, and that treats the majority of the high pollutant load area coming off the site. So I believe we've kind of taken extra efforts to address that one as well. Uh, no pesticides and herbicides to be allowed on lots one and lot two, since the abutters wetland is downhill and downstream of the proposed development. Uh, that's that's one where you can request that minimal. Herbicides and, and pesticides will be utilized. Uh, again, it's one. It's something the developer doesn't really want to have to uh, use a lot of that anyway. Uh, but again, uh, the intent was to try and prevent as much as much pollutant load downstream as possible with the design presented here. Before clearing trees, the developer should clearly mark which trees are to be retained on lots one and two. And uh, while it's ideal to keep certain trees. I think the development will kind of dictate which trees will have to come down. Uh, we'll make sure to protect any trees that are beyond that lot line and supplement with uh, landscape trees uh, to whatever extent the planning board feels appropriate. I think that's also item eight with the wooded buffer. I think that kind of addresses that issue as well. Yes. Ed, I did have a comment as well about the strain of the development on the community. And that's something that we had kind of talked, discussed before. Mm -hmm. How we had to go to each utility and, and make sure that they could supply you know, the water and, and, and sewer service that was required for it, uh, as well as the, uh, the report that the school district gives to the town manager every year indicating that you know, there is sufficient capacity and what the what the state of the school system is so i think all those were covered is that a oh, okay the comp plan okay So in the comprehensive plan, it talks about the schooling and the uh, infrastructure for fire, police, and stuff like that. And um, that's what Jerry was just noting that in the new comp plan, it, it targets all of those. Um, I think James has that information. 
because they're pulling it together for the comp plan. Yes, he probably does. Um, we've asked to see that. I know uh, Phil has a couple times, you know, from the sewer or the water the school. Yeah, well, the, I think the problem with it is getting them to say more than we have sufficient capacity and we'll let you know when it becomes a problem is a little bit difficult. <laughs> getting them to kind of, I won't say it's like nailing jello to a tree, but I will say it's definitely an exercise as far as the school districts. Again, you know, it, they report to James every year and he is working on that. He may have that. I know that we do have. Um, current figures, that's a, a little bit outdated, but current figures are currently uh, a whole whopping four students higher than like 1980 or 1990. So we're kind of in the superintendent. You know, all of the, the one thing I will tell the board is that when these applications are received, and the public may not be aware of this either, when these applications are received, the uh, developers are required for any of these to submit a digital copy as well which goes to Terry. Terry. Terry immediately sends it out to Hannah. It also goes to police. It goes to fire. This, you know, Everybody gets to take a kick at the can, so to speak. Water, mm -hmm. sewer, everybody has to get a kick at the can to make sure that before you guys even see it, they've reviewed it, so if they have a problem, they can tell us that they can't support it. Mm -hmm. And that's all we really look for in the application is just for those letters saying that, that, is, that they have adequate supply Yes, and you will probably never see an application that does not have one of those letters saying they have adequate supply, because if there is not adequate supply for water, not adequate supply for sewer, um, if police fire, if any of the services feel like they are overburdened and they say that, dollars to donuts, the applicant applicant would probably, re you know, remove their application, knowing that they're not going to be able to get the services for whoever they're putting in. And we do often see conditions by chief plant for fire that he needs this or that or mm -hmm. so they do take it look at it consider mm -hmm. it and give us as a board recommendations to put onto the project yep. so it is covered yeah exactly. fire is typically who we get the most comments from Correct. as yes. far as hydrants turnarounds things like that they have a little little more skin in the game and bigger equipment to play with mm -hmm. <laughs> but they are all reviewed and i don't know that the general public is aware that they are all reviewed by all of these entities but they are So, you said you were going to agree to bring a biologist in to, for the uh, spice push? If, uh, if it's a pleasure of the board as a final condition of approval, that'd be something that you're willing to do and get that, uh, bring them in to have that on file. It's likely, especially if it's if uh, Sarah has them located in the, in the areas where they actually are located, it won't have uh, a large impact on on the development, it's it's basically going to be you know we have to put protections up so that people don't don't remove them you know accidentally and yeah. keep, make make sure they stay safe on the site. I think that that's an important thing. I'd like to see that as a condition yeah. for the and project that a biologist does do that review and make recommendations. Yeah, and while they're at that, make the recommendations <coughs> to um, so the knotweed doesn't get spread all over the place. Also, I mean I. If you're going to bring a biologist in, they're going to look at it anyway, right? Yeah. So, because that's that's the two important things I really took from that report. Did you hear that? I, didn't, I missed part of that. Did you say that again? I couldn't hear you. Oh, the knot we. Oh, the knot we. Yeah. Recommendation. That's all. You're bringing a biologist in anyway, so. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a double edged sword, right? You know, there's knot weed, so how do you deal with knot weed? Right. But then we don't want to put her herbicide down. Right. To kill it. Yeah. You know, we we will. The entire uh, development area will get stripped of the material that's there. I mean, there's no question. Yeah. So the area that we're going to develop, that is going to go away. I mean, I, I don't think I'm going to go the whole 18 acres and search out not we. No, no, I'm not asking. I'm growing naturally in the woods. I think that's. that's where it is. Um, I think we're talking about the roadway, correct? I have a I have a question um, that might kind of address a little bit more uh, of what I read in the, the one that I read out to you. Um, do you guys, okay, first of all, where is, so I guess I got a couple questions, where does the pavement currently stop on Normand? It currently stops right Back up here. Back there, beyond where the development's going, okay. 
Um, I guess so my question would be, it appears to me from the letter that I read out loud um, that the concern is that with the track out, because, and I, trust me, I had not weed, I get it, they're concerned about any of those rhizomes being stuck in the tires of the trucks going out, which I, as the code officer, have to be concerned about track out anyways from your site and if you're mucking up the, the roads. Do you have, what do you have, do you have anything in mind for preventing excessive track out because whatever prevents the track out will also more than likely prevent any knotweed that might be getting tracked in that soil getting tracked out. What's proposed is a, a typical uh, stabilized road control entrance. Okay. Uh, so it'd be, it'd be at the at the existing entrance, it'd be um, you know, a certain length of, of larger stone that's intended to, to take off all the... Okay. I didn't know where it was paved if you guys are still planning to do that. So yeah. I didn't know if you had something else in mind because that will remove most of whatever right. might that, be in those tires. The location of that's probably going to vary depending on what portion is getting, mm -hmm. getting developed at the time, uh, but it'll be at the, at the end of, of the I work have, area. I have strict requirements. I'm going to require be somewhere between where you're digging up and the end of the road. road okay. I mean it. <laughs> so I, I think I'd also like to, somebody mentioned, I don't remember who, but somebody mentioned about the uh, subcontractors on uh, my current project, Navina Estates, and that they, I, I know that they treat that like a drag strip. And unfortunately, in that situation, you know, I developed that site and I sold house lots to uh, Atco Construction. And then once I sell a house lot, it's beyond my control what they do. Uh, I know my guys, you know, I'm, I'm constantly on my guys. I have three employees. So um, this project will be done by my employees, and any subcontractors will be subcontractors directly from me, and uh, they won't be acting that way. Yeah, it's hard to, that's hard to control, period. What's that? It's hard to control that when, I mean, you're talking about individuals. I mean, 14 yeah. houses, you know, you have, you know, six or seven different subcontractors for each house and five houses going on and yeah. none, of them, none of them work for me i can't you know along the lines of um traffic i know there were concerns about um the use of old pine hill and the traffic that's increased there um but the developer isn't responsible for stop signs and crosswalks mm -hmm. and things on no, the town that road. has to go through the state so I understand the concern of the public that it would be great to be able to just throw speed bumps in and stop signs and lights and crosswalks, but um, as far as the development goes, it's not under that jurisdiction. Right. And that initial traffic assessment that, that we provided basically shows, and the reason we, we did it so detailed is this one is kind of dictated by the trips it generates, where if you generate too many trips, you'd end up having to do a second entrance out here. So it's, you know, we, we, we're sure to make that detailed and, and be as you know, cautious as we could with it so I will I will say for the people that are concerned both here and at home that uh, James Bellissimo the town manager is the one that reaches out to the state for the, the Department of Transportation to send along any comments or concerns that residents have about the roads so they can email him if they want something the town manager James Bellissimo he's right on the website Thank you. You're welcome. He's the one that can make that contact uh, to pass those concerns along for residents, not guaranteeing that anything can be done, but at least he knows who to reach out to so your your concerns can be heard because I don't want people thinking that their concerns were not heard here tonight. It's just that they're not necessarily being directed to the people who can do something. So send you to where we can get you some help. <laughs> flow I mean how it states is the water flow going it basically you basically can't change the water that's flowing correct like the amount of water as far as the, going like the drainage off. the stormwater runoff yes. um, no what's what we're 
basically doing is we're increasing the size of, of uh, the, culvert. Of the culvert year. Yep. Uh, as the stormwater modeling indicated that it was not sufficient in the bigger storms uh, to hold that back and it would overtop, overtop the road and, and, and damage it. Okay. Uh, so that was upgraded as well as uh, it was uh, put into a pipe here. This, the, the, the drainage swale that was out here was not uh, delineated as a wetland uh, when the wetland study was done. Uh, this larger wetland down here this is the one that has the multiple large culverts going through the uh, through the cul-de-sac at, at Halflinger Lane, and this is uh, this is the, the wetland that we were uh, really trying to protect from, uh, you know, the parking area up here, and it was the main reason that we wanted to put in this, uh, you know, the previous pavement out there to treat all of that high pollutant load uh, coming from that area, treat it down through that filter, and have uh, you know a stable, clean. Uh, mm -hmm cooled down water coming out through into that wetland to prevent any of the any of the you know, the harmful side effects that they were kind of discussed mm -hmm. uh, in the public. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of the concerns was the um, abutting properties just want to make sure that the water basically stays like it's not going to be a drought over there you're not re-diverting the water. Correct. Or no it's 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 all going it's it's going to be going in the same uh, in the same general direction. Okay. It's just we're trying um, to get it treated for it. And then, so I guess there's two different things. Um, one is wetland versus wetlands. Like you yeah. have land that gets wet, yeah. and then you have wetlands that are noted and they're on Actually, the map yeah. as. Yeah. So on uh, lot one. <coughs> there's a specific amount of gravel that you can add to the wet land. That's, no, those are, that's, that's mapped wetlands. Okay. But uh, the isolated uh, smaller wetlands are, uh, you can impact those uh, without the full permitting because NRPA and, and, uh, and DEP have determined that it's not, not a harmful impact. Uh, and for this particular project, it allows us to keep, if this wetland is impacted and filled and allowed the development to be closer to that, it keeps it away, further from away from, right. uh, from the back larger the back. wetland. Yep. And in this case, uh, if there is spice bush in that area, it keeps it further away from that as well. Okay. What all are you trying to filter out with that pervious, uh, you're talking about like parking lot runoff? Yeah, basically, you know, hydrocarbons, uh, General Oils, solids, solids, yeah, all that stuff. Anything that leaks from vehicles, right? The, and we, we basically we used uh, the D, the DEP uh, model for you know the, the capacity and the and the runoff through that uh, to design it. Uh, so it, it's basically getting treated to uh, a project that would have to be if it was big enough to be regulated by the DEP. This one's small enough, so they don't truly require any of this. This is just kind of uh, an effort to. Go above and beyond and make sure that this wetland doesn't doesn't see any degradation. Okay. Hey, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I'm 99 percent sure that Mr. Belissimo said that we cannot do anything on that road because it's town. But we may be wrong. I may be wrong. I may have the. So after the last meeting, um, which I wasn't here for, but Lee J was here. Lee J reached out to. Uh, Dean, who is our one of our in-house transportation planners, um, asking about Old Pine Hill Road and any um, <coughs> traffic calming, any types of um, that that could be put in. Um, and his response was, Old Pine Hill Road by the library is a town way and under local jurisdiction. Uh, he would prefer to go visit the site before he made any recommendations as to what the board may consider requesting. Um, but he said, at a minimum, they may be looking at requiring a high visibility crosswalk marking, parking restrictions on crosswalk approaches, adequate nighttime lighting levels, and crossing warning signs, for examples. Um, additional considerations could be a raised crosswalk or in-road signage, uh, and he's, he's willing to go and visit the site and give comments to the board. Okay. So I apologize, it appears I was wrong. <coughs> so now I'm wondering which road James and I were actually not talking about the same road on. <laughs> <laughs> not the first time. Could have been a different part or um, a different final, no, I don't know. Yeah, 
Who knows? Mm, probably not. Into the town. That would be a selectman thing. Yeah. 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 Right, it would be a town. Yeah. 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 What we would be trying to do is either if there would be like a crosswalk that goes to the library or something of that. That would be what the library was requesting, yes. Yeah. Yep. So well, it, it would make sense to me anyway that we encourage the public who have concerns about that to take that up with the selectmen and the town and James Melissa With the Mullen. speed, yes. Yeah, not um, with us on this I, I will say that the last traffic study, it, the... They basically said that the speed, I, I get what the public says versus what the traffic studies say, but the last time the traffic study happened, there was no issues with over speeding. It's, it's a 1% issue. It's a very small amount of people that do speed. Uh, with speeding, it's they set the averages, and it, you see the things yep. on the road, yep. and they, they go by that, and when they go by that, a lot of people see that as they slow down, and I get that. But at the same time, it's that's what the testing goes by, and there hasn't been that many speeding incidents mm -hmm. from that study. Um, is there any other questions or concerns? Yeah, I'm starting to run low on coffee. You know what that means, boys and girls? Yeah, you won't sleep anyway, so it doesn't matter. It's decaf, honey. <laughs> but when it's out, I'm out. <laughs> um, I don't think I had any other questions. Um, so for lot one, um, for the buffer in the back, um, would you be willing to say, like, to designate a no-cut zone or just a certain area that they won't? I know the spice bush is out back there. Um, just at the back property line here? Yeah, yeah. I, I'd be hesitant to do that just due to the fact that it was, if unless the spice bush, the spice bush needed protecting back there. Okay. We take that under consideration and add that to it. Okay. Uh, the, the lot itself still does have, you know, some area left uh, you know, to, to leave that as a protection, Okay. Uh, but I try to encumber it as little as possible just due to the fact that it's going to be a separate, separate developer out there, it's going to be a separate house builder. Right, builders. right, because we're just talking about the lot, right. and just it's a buildable lot at that point, and your building footprint can be within a certain area. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, oh, it's going to be a separate permit anyway. Right. <coughs> Um, I don't see my memo from you. Is there any waivers that we're granting or I'm, voting on? I'm pretty sure if there were, they would have already been granted. Okay. All right. Just making sure. Yep. Um, so now, um, so now at this point you can consider preliminary approval and provide a list of changes you want made conditions. before final, um, or you can ask for changes and not okay. approve the preliminary and do that next time. So going through these requested conditions. Um, well, first, let's let's discuss out of character buildings. Um, I guess that was a concern. Um, yeah, I think that if I if I could speak Please. to that, um, you know, I, I can appreciate that. You know, and as a developer, there's. Uh, there's a balancing act of, you know, the highest and best use of a property, uh, meeting the demand for housing around here, and the environmental impact. Typically, I build townhouses. If I built townhouses, this development would be this big, and we would, we would you know, damage four times the environmental impact. Um, as far as out of character, uh, this is directly across the street from an auto repair garage. So this is not... Um, you know, there are residential houses there, and I don't want to minimize that for sure. Yeah. This, these are definitely, you know, they're going to be attractive buildings, but they're definitely three-story buildings, and I definitely weighed those uh, that consideration greatly when we looked at doing townhouses or doing these. 
we opted for the townhouses to minimize the environmental impact. And also with the auto repair garage across the street, we thought that they were more fitting to the neighborhood. Now, you won't be able to see these buildings from the uh, old Pine Hill Road, is that correct? You'd have to be kind of slowing down and looking back in towards it. Right, it'd be very difficult to see it. So. I can't say they'd be invisible from there, but it'd be an effort. Right. Okay. And, and it is, you know, in that neighborhood. Granted, there are only three-story buildings, but there are condos right across the street Pine Hill, from High, Pine Hill Road, and then there are also my townhouses not far from there. So, so this kind of is a neighborhood of, uh, you know, like I know that that the R1 R2 line is right here. Um, so it is just outside of that R1 R2. But that neighborhood really, with the condos and my other townhouses there. And the library, the auto repair garage, um, is uh, you know, I, I don't think that they're I don't think they're out of place there, or, or I would have opted to do the townhouses. Okay. You guys have anything to add on that? In regards to what, as far as your uh, out of an out of character building? Yeah, that's it's an odd turn of phrase, but I think. Um, as far as saying an out of character building because when you drive through any neighborhood what do you see you, you know unless you are in literally a development that's been built by just one person you see a variety of houses so what in fact defines an out of character building if they wanted to build a all black roman gothic style that i would consider an out of character building um an apartment building that's literally a stone's throw from the R1 line where we have multiple multi-families I don't consider out of character when we were walking on the site as we came out towards that single house lot um, because again when I approve the building permits I have to consider all the ordinances These, this book is what everybody wants and but as you walk out of Norman Court you look across you see the other buildings you see large buildings and we do have the height restriction of 35 feet so nothing can be bigger than that so nothing can really be built out of character um, I, I take a little bit of issue with that term just because it's not really clearly defined as to what right. they're considering it's out subjective of character. Yeah. it's too yeah. Yeah. yeah it's too subjective because if somebody wants to do something with some nice pillared architecture next to a farmhouse am I who am I to tell somebody no you can't style your house the way you want but I do get the point where it applies to this in the neighbor's concerns with it being an apartment building. But that having been said, again, like literally you can't swing a dead cat without hitting the R1 line. And R1, I can't even tell you how many apartment buildings I've been in and I haven't even been here a full year yet mm -hmm. in the R1 zone. So to me, no, not not meeting. I don't think it passes the straight face test of saying it would be out of character for mm -hmm. that area. Les, what is the um, visual sight line of any abutters to the buildings where they're going to be? Are they going to have direct sight line to your buildings, or will there the be? Abutter is, the abutter is going to uh, spoke earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't hear what he said. I, I have a lot of trouble hearing him. Uh, he said he was in favor of it. He's in yeah. favor. He's on board with yeah, the whole plan. He was in the sight line. He's directly across the street. I mean, he is right. Yeah, last. <laughs> you gotta yeah. use the mic. Bob, you gotta use the pointer. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the middle one. So he is this property right here, and this uh, the owner of this property spoke uh, at the last, the last meeting. meeting yeah. And then you know I think it was mentioned that you know I gave this parcel to my sister. So in five or six years when she retires, we're going to build her a house back there. So that's that's all that's going to go on here. Uh, the only other the only other person on the street is uh, I believe his name is Norman, um, and so uh, but I haven't heard anything from him. Right. And then. 
just uh, also to go with the out of character buildings. I know f a little bit further down on Pine Hill Road, there is a apartment building that is 35 feet high. Mm -hmm. It's not too far away from there, and that is also an R2 zone. Yes. So it's not that far away. Um, just want to make that a note as well. Um, and, uh, I can't say what the name of it. Did but you it, say Old Pine or Pine? No, Pine Hill. Pine Hill. Yep. Yeah. Um, I do. I do want to address one thing. So while I recognize that because this is a project um, that they, you know, the request for an environmental review for the spice bush is not not at all out of line. Okay. That having been said. Um, in regards to the rest of the uh, tree cutting issues. Um, yes, there were a lot of trees cut in that area recently to make all of the new homes on Halflinger Lane. So, I mean, there's already been some deforestation there, but going down there, I see it's been done, um, in my opinion, and as somebody who has to do some MS4 inspections down there, as well as code inspections, it's been done responsibly. Now that having been said, if he was not, not just this developer, um, literally every developer we've had come before us that people have had concerns with them cutting the trees. If they chose to just chop wood and cut these trees up, we couldn't stop them. They own the land. So I think it's very, um, I think it's very responsible and ethical to get the environmental review for the spice bush. But again, we do not, unless you're in a shoreland zone, we cannot control somebody cutting trees and I want to make that clear um, and even in a shoreland zone they can do so with certain permissions or if like the one at the end of Norman Court that one is rotting it's going to be not it's doesn't have much longer if this if this doesn't get approved or if less in his developing corporation decide to not do it that tree is still ultimately gonna to have to come down because it is going to be a major safety hazard mm -hmm. so as much as people get concerned about the tree cutting, um, please know that there is very limited that the town has any legal right to restrict. So I just feel like that should be said. Mm -hmm. While I agree with you, Irish, I would I would say that the reason we have the process that we do to have a public hearing and give the townspeople a chance to voice their concerns and opinions um, is important. And I think that it's important that they get heard. And I think that it's important that we let the developer hear it not that they have a requirement to do anything we can't insist on that right. but in the spirit as, as Phil would often say in the spirit of good neighbors mm -hmm. um, it, it alerts everybody to being on the same page and just trying to find a, a, a compromise yep. no I absolutely agree with you Rick I really I agree with you that they should be heard and they should have the right and especially when it pertains to a buffer but what I'm saying is I want people to understand that the board may be able to say you, you want a buffer. The board right. can't just randomly tell everybody they can't cut any trees right. down. Right. So that's, I just want to make it clear so they don't think that the board is not doing what they're supposed right. to right. because legally you can't tell them they can't cut any trees. Right. You and can tell them to leave a buffer, but you can't, I don't want people thinking that you're not doing what you're supposed right. to. Right. But I do believe, yes, the developer should hear what the neighbors yeah. have to say Good about point. it. Yep. Also, with the property lines, there's a 10 foot buffer from both sides that it's basically if you're cutting down trees you have to talk to the abutting neighbors because it's technically every other tree one could be yours one could be the neighbors and how that goes is you usually need consent from the mm -hmm. abutter to yeah. cut trees yeah. down yeah. up up to 10 feet from the property from the property line yeah I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that the board has a limitation on what right. you can right. restrict for tree cutting. That's, I guess, where I was going with yeah. that. But we can't because pick it's the trees. Main is, if I main could, is too, I'd, I'd add issue. about the trees. You know, one of the things, you know, I am a developer, but I also am environmentally responsible. And, you know, if you look at this entire parcel, this entire parcel is 38 acres. And, um, you know, I'm developing this piece right here. And I'm going to put a house here for my sister. And the rest of this is going to remain forested. And it's going to remain forested because uh, we've maximized the trip count for this road. So we can't put any more on here. So this really, you know, in the comprehensive plan, we talk about cluster developments. It doesn't get much more of a cluster development than this. Right. 
and so it, technically this isn't a cluster development but really it, it meets the definition and the, and the spirit of cluster development right. and again all of this land here you know there's gonna be one house back here so I mean you know I think if, if I had followed the plan that I had approved previously we built 52 houses with this in Navina Estates this would have been you know um, I don't know, 27, 30 houses would have went in here, road, infrastructure. Yeah, a lot more impact. The, the amount of environmental impact would have been, you know, horrible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to note, too. I mean, the requirement of free space percentage-wise is actually relatively small in comparison to the size that you're going to develop. But, but when developments have this much, significantly more than the percentage required, it's a good thing. Right. Yeah. It, it protects that land in you know, forever. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so one of the conditions would be to have the spice bush plants noted and um, do that study with the uh, IFW. Just be a, a state licensed biologist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Doesn't have to be. Yep. Or... It'll be a lot quicker. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Someone else did. All right. Um, for the invasive plants, um, just like what Irish said earlier, with the requirements that you have to do the the dirt for the road, the track out, the sure. track, yeah, yep. the track out, which that got voted in last last section for the MS four. Um, the new requirements for that should be adequate. Um, let's see what else. We don't really have a say of what what trees they they. No, but the buffer. The buffer. Um, the the wooded. So number eight, the developer should leave a wooded buffer on the sides and backs of both lots to ensure that the mature trees near the property lines are not killed by heavy equipment cutting through. Um, That's right. I don't think that can be a true requirement. The, the setbacks right. have to be adhered to right. the development. And then uh, beyond that, it's, it will be you know, having to adhere to the, to the requirements just for you know, the, the trees at the lot. Right, right. Okay. And, 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 you know, we're only going to clear the trees that we need to clear. Mm -hmm. Right. And as right. far as the root balls of trees that we leave, I mean, we have to dig what we have to dig, but we're not going to be randomly digging all the backyard. Right, right. You know, if we have to put a foundation in, the tree's not going to be within 25 feet of that building anyway. So. Right. And you're going to want to have enough separation of the tree line versus where your buildings are going to be because yeah. you don't want pine trees crashing into your houses or in your right. apartments. So, um I understand that is um, I guess another condition would just be um, what was it? the minimal use of pesticides and herbicides um, that would just be a condition um, I can't say that you can't use it but I would just limit it to just saying a minimal amount I, mean, I, don't, I don't plan on using any unless right, right. maybe poison ivy or something, but I don't, most of this is going to get bulldozed up into a pile and ran through a screener, so I don't, okay. you know, sit there for a year in a pile and all decompose. Right. Okay. Um, okay. And then uh, Tenuvial had that question about survey by main DEP. Uh, about the spice bush. Okay, that was about yeah, the spice bush. Thing, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's the same one with that. Yeah, let me just double check that one. Hold on, I stuffed it in the packet the information. Is on the on. Yeah, I would tell. So that's that's the one ah, yes. So, um, this is an, another thing that's in this uh, Tenovia that had the the uh, the letter I read. Um, 
I think something that uh, well, let's just so they're taking care of that. Who who did the wetland mapping? Are you using the online wetland mapping? Uh, no, it was uh, done by uh, Morse. Uh, Morse. Okay, so you actually had it done. Correct. Okay, so that so that takes care of her first concern. Second concern. Autumn on olive, olive smells amazing, just for the record. Uh, we already addressed that. Okay. So then I'm going to pass this along to James for discussion about the uh, terrific thing. Sure. To get it to about the reduction of speed That's that she was asking about. about. Right. Okay. Did, did we have the stormwater management plan reviewed by a third party engineer? In the memo from Hannah, the last one, it said that we could, we should consider, or we could determine if we wanted that or not. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if we need, if we wanted that or not. It just says the applicant has submitted a stormwater management plan. The planning board should determine if this plan should be peer reviewed by a third party engineer. The DEP did this one. We had, did yeah, we had sent uh, everything to the DEP just for the PBR. Um, so. Approval and generally, if, if they see anything that, that they, they would have flagged it, yeah, yeah. they determine to be a okay. cause of concern, they'd flag it for this particular uh, project. It's the stormwater study that we did, technically, isn't even required. Uh, right. It's it meets the threshold to go into chapter 500, but doesn't meet the threshold to have the stormwater uh, analysis done. Uh, so, sending in the PBR and having them accept it basically takes care of all the stormwater, but we kind of tried to go the extra step to show that you know, we had the report that said it wasn't impacting that downstream water. Okay. It's kind of going above and beyond. Okay. All right. So that should be adequate for that. Um, All right, so I guess the only two conditions are just the minimal use of pesticides and herbicides and then the um, biologist the biologist for identifying uh, spice bush plants and limiting um, I guess just identifying them and then possibly staying away from them yes. we do have we have biologists that we utilize that uh, do that product for previous it was noted on the plan. yeah it'd be noted on the plants right. okay all right um, so after that, I guess I'll make a motion that we find the preliminary application complete. Um, we already did that. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Approval of preliminary plan with conditions, with the conditions. So. I'll make a motion that we approve the preliminary subject to the conditions. Can we, is, can the preliminary be approved with those conditions as the final, I'm, final condition? I'm getting the wording. <laughs> <laughs> Please hold. Please hold for the next available. When granting approval to a preliminary plan, the board shall state the conditions of such approval, if any, with respect to the specific changes which it will require in the final plan, the character and extent of the required improvements for which waivers may have been requested, and which the board finds may be waived without jeopardy to the public health, safety, and general welfare, and the construction of item or the construction items for which cost estimates and performance guarantees will be required as prerequisite to the approval of the final plan. So you can approve the preliminary plan and say these are our conditions that you need to meet before we'll approve your final plan or these will be conditions that will also be placed on the final plan. I will say that again. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So we can set the conditions to be met before the final, the final plan is accepted mm -hmm. or we could adopt it into being in the final plan yes. conditions. Yes. So yeah, if there are um, changes you want made before you will appro approve the final plan, say those. And if there are conditions that you want to be placed on the final plan as a condition of final approval, 
such as, you know, you have to do this before we'll issue a rail link permit. Okay. Things like so that. I guess There's at that point, the condition, the one condition would just be the um, biologist with the spice bush for the um, preliminary approval before the final. And then for the final would be the minimal use of herbicides and pesticides. Yeah, yeah. so the what I understand is that the board wants to see the study from the biologist yep. showing the spice bush yep. before you will approve a final plan. Correct, correct. And then when you approve the final plan, the thing about the herbicides and the pesticides will be a condition on there. Yes. Okay. What she said. <laughs> So, so I've made the motion. I'll second the motion. Okay, further discussion? <laughs> okay, all in favor? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what she said. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. That was a lot smarter than trying to refuse. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Hannah. All right. Um, all right. Good good my um, there is no new business, so we can skip through that. Uh, second public comment is open to non agenda items. Okay, uh, seeing no one come up, I'll close that. Informational items. You girls have any informational items? Email. Um, we have our training next week at uh, six? Six. Yeah. Six with myself, BJ, and our attorney, Phil Saucier. And that is after our, our site walk. Yes. Site but walk? I will send out a reminder. What time's the site walk? Five. 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 For what project? For what went what, what, solar. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I guess you said that last time. Didn't you? Again, make sure you have all your questions written out so we can mm -hmm. make the most use of the time. And if anyone would like to come in and continue watching the video, we will make it available if you let us know. Laptops always available for you to come in and sit and watch it. And, I got to uh, get the first hour in. Uh, we only made 49 minutes of it. Yeah. They told me it was an hour and a half. It turned out to be a three, three and a half hour, hour video. Yeah, not you, what we wanted. Did you guys end up watching it all yesterday? <laughs> not all of it. Okay. You can. Dual, duly noted, I did not touch my microphone. Uh, <laughs> I would like to give uh, Mr. Ganarelli a, uh, a little personal round of applause from the no. BCM media people for not touching his microphone. Good job. <laughs> hey, hey, Jerry. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> um, I don't think we have anything else for the planning board right now. Okay. Make a motion that we adjourn. I'll second that motion. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Good night. Good night, folks.